Welcome to the graduate lecture series hosted by the Visual Arts Department at UC San Diego. My name is Philomena Lopez. I am a PhD art history student and Bailey Davenport, a second year MFA candidate will be moderating a Q&A after the lecture. A special thanks to the Visual Arts Department and those making this event poss possible, including Amy Adler and Paolo Suniga. Our speaker this evening is the curator at LACE. She holds a BA in Ciencias de la Cultura from the Universidad del Claustro de Sor Juana, Mexico City, and an MA in Art and Curatorial Practices in the Public Sphere from the University of Southern California. She has an extensive curatorial background working with artists, collectives, and institutions in Mexico, along borders, and in Los Angeles. In addition to her innovative curatorial projects and public programming, her outreach initiatives demonstrate a unique and radical approach to cultural production. Her current project, Intergalactic Against Isolation slash Contra el Aislamiento, was awarded an Andy Warhol Curatorial Fellowship for its research phase and recently a grant from the Mike Kelly Foundation for the Arts. Please welcome Daniela Lieja Quintanar. Hello, thank you, Filomena, for the introduction. Um, hello, everybody out there. Thank you for joining this uh, talk about my curatorial practice. Thank you for the Visual Arts Department of UCSD San Diego, and a special thanks to Amy Adler and Filomena. So um, I want to start this lecture first um, locating myself, uh, telling you where, where I am. Um, so first of all, I am where I am geographically and where I am speaking from, where, is, where I have been developing my thinking and my curatorial practice. So I am in Apachianga the traditional land Tovanga, inhabited by Tonga people and many other native groups. Apachianga is the east of the now known uh, Los Angeles. Specifically, I am located in the neighborhood of Boyle Heights. Um, Boyle Heights is a very important neighborhood um, because it's where I live and it has been a really special place for me because the neighbors, the, the families around here has embraced me and accept me and be part of this community. Since five years ago that I'm here, I have only six years living in the United States, all my life living before in Mexico City. So Boy Heights is a very power, has a very powerful history of resistance against racism, displacement, and erasure. For example, Mothers of East LA and Union de Vecinos are organizations that have participated in this history. Boy Heights is the core of the anti-gentrification fight. So I am sharing this because my curatorial practice is influenced by the places where I live and my contacts. And this is my context before I live in Mexico City, as I mentioned, and I specifically work in the historic center, um, which is the core of, it's like the heart of Tenochtitlan. Um, so this is this place, the space where I'm talking. So I'm going to share my presentation now. Um, okay. okay. So here we go. So this is LACE, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, located in Hollywood Boulevard. Um, this has been my home 
for my curatorial practice, for my experiments. And um, also it has been my home because the community that um, comes to this place, the art community, um, I have learned a lot from them and I have worked a lot with them. Um, Lace, uh, if you don't know, Lace is, sorry, I'm just trying to, okay. If you don't know, Lace was founded in 1978 by a group of artists. It's the longest running um, art space in Los Angeles. And some of the artists that found this space and this organization are Chicano artists um, that are part of the legacy of the history of Los Angeles in contemporary art like Harry Gamboa Jr., Gronk, the collective ASCO that you can see here. Um, I don't know how do I notice here. Just gonna move it like this. This you can see here. Um, this is uh, the leader Nervous Gender from the band, the band called Nervous Gender, the collective ASCO. Also here, this is in the 70s. This is a, a Halloween party that Patsy Valdez and Gronk organized in the 70s. And here you have the Ana Mendieta show, the retrospective uh, in 1989. Here in the middle, there is a show called Jeffrey Valance that the Jeffrey Valance did called the Richard Nixon Museum, along with the Museum Salinas. And on this side, you can see the Border Art Workshop and Taller de Arte Fronterizo, Destination LA. Those are shows that has been influenced on my practice, um, has a very specific connection with what, I'm, what I have been developing since I was in Mexico City. So now, so I am listing here a series of, um, you know, a series of characteristics in my curatorial practice. My curatorial practice is collaborative, is multidimensional, is active in the colonized, is transfeminist, is focus on build strat strategies and alliance. My curatorial practice is in coalition and looks for coalition, is experimental. I know this is kind of like a quality that in art all of us we are looking at, but I like to mention it. Uh, my curatorial practice, open spaces, is intergalactic, and this is a specific reference to the Zapatista movement and the EZLN uh, is expansive, wide open. Uh, usually I have developed projects that are really big, very expansive and wide. Uh, sometimes people say that I do connect big teams between each other. And yeah, that's very intentional. Um, I like to see the whole picture too, and not, not to reject also that focusing on a specific topics is a good curatorial practice. But I'm, I'm right now invested in the expansive notion. Uh, my curatorial practice uh, has grassroots in collective movements, in collective life. Um, and then the transfeminist concept is, connected with Sayak Valencia, who is an amazing thinker and writer and philosopher and also artist uh, working in Tijuana. And she has developed a very important discourse, um, contemporary discourse. Um, and here I have a quote, it's a long quote and I'm gonna read it. Um, and it's very dense, but it's good. A transfeminist perspective understood as an epistemology, 
epistemological tool that does not merely include transgender discourse within feminism, nor suggests overcoming feminism, but as a network that considers stages of transis, migration, mestizaje, vulnerability, race, class, and gender and articulates them with the historical memory of social uprisings, uprisings. This articulation I'm very interested in. To open up spaces and discursive fields to all of the practice, practices and subjects of our contemporary moment. to the minoritarian becoming that are not directly taken into account by institutional hetero white biologicist feminist. So you're gonna, you're gonna see um, these concepts coming up in, while I'm like showing some of my curatorial practice, some of my exhibitions, I am mm, just concentrating in three shows, two very fast and then one more deep in. So actually my first show at LACE it was El Teatro Campesino, sorry the helicopters, 1965 to 1975. So this exhibition I co-curated with Sam Gregg. Um, what we tried to do in this exhibition was to locate El Teatro Campesino within the context of contemporary art and in the lineage of social practice. And we wanted to put out El Teatro Campesino or put it in other place other than Chicano history, Chicano theater, that that's where you usually find this history, but we wanted to put it in a contemporary art, uh, California history. Why? Because we see these 10 years of El Teatro Campesino as a collective artistic practice that involved performance, we wanted to decentralize the male figure of Luis Valdez. And we wanna show this Teatro Campesino as a collective that was, as a troupe that was. Um, uh, somebody that helped us to go through, to shift the perspective of, of El Teatro Campesino as just this big company um, was, uh, directed by Luis Valdez. Uh, this person was um, Diane Rodriguez, who recently, unfortunately, um, passed, passed away. And she was an amazing director, producer, play writer, and advocate. Um, and she gave us her own story and her own interpretation of El Teatro Campesino. So in El Teatro Campesino, we present some newspapers and different um, publications that they create uh, in the 70s. And one of the publications that we present was the Black Panthers newsletter, newspapers, because the Black Panthers in the 70s actually support the UFW movement and support the boycott. And so the next year, this was 2017, and in 2018, I co-curate, again, this is a series of shows on the storefront of Lays, um, dedicated to re revisit the history of California in, in a different way. So we connected with that moment of coalition, I was talking before about coalition uh, in my practice, between the Black Panthers and El Teatro Campesino. Very different movements, but they have a lot of dialogue between them. So in 2018, in the summer, I co-curated this show with Essence Harden, which was 
an amazing curator. If you are interested in uh, contemporary art curators in LA, she's a really great curator to follow. And this show was dedicated to put Emora Douglas not only as the first minister of culture of the Black Panthers, um, but also put him as an artist, you know, like put him in the history of art and uh, locate him connected with, in dialogue, in conversation with other contemporary artists. So in the back, you can see there's some other artworks. Uh, the neon artwork is Patrick Martinez and uh, Juan Capistran and uh, also Sadie Barnett and Caleb Duarte were artists of different generations that were in dialogue with the artwork of Emory Douglas. And we present our work of Emory Douglas from their, the 70s, 80s, but also the 2019, 2018, 18 in that moment. So the, talking about coalitions, I wanna show it this slide. This was a vitrine that we have in the, in the um, exhibition. And this is very interesting because the Black Panthers were doing this intergalactic that also I'm talking about these connections, these sharing um, movements, these recognizing the other movements. And in the left, uh, this brown inside newspaper was dedicated, this one that says Children of Zapata was dedicated to the student movement in 1968 in Mexico City. Then we can see the African Liberation Day that was connected with the different revolutions in Africa, Vietnam, the Native American struggle, China, and here you can read Afro-American solidarity with the oppressed people of the world and the representation of the US as the imperialism um, is very interesting. Here it says, get out of the ghetto, get out of Latin America, get out of Asia and get out of Africa, which is something that we should still continue asking. And then one of the center pieces were these embroideries, uh, the Zapatena, Zapantera Negra, um, this is a project that Caleb Duarte, he's from Fresno, organized in Chiapas. He brought Emory Douglas to Chiapas and work in a collaborative project with a collective of Zapatista indigenous women. I know that saying Zapatista indigenous is kind of saying double of the same. Uh, uh, Zapatista is always gonna be an indigenous but I want to say like to highlight that. And what they did, it was um, this project here uh, is a series of six embroideries that they put together their, the Black Panther iconography and the Zapatista iconography, and then create this new force, this new coalition, this new front this new alliance, even if it happened at different times, even if they happen in different places, there are still struggles alive uh, somehow. And then you can see here, um, this woman how is dressing uh, more like indigenous um, reference, but also she's holding something that looks like corn, uh, same here. And this is handmade, this is embroidery. You might not see it very well in detail here, but this is embroidery. It's like, again, it's a bold visual language. So for me, this was like a very important piece because really connect across, you know, no matter times, culture, and histories, but the struggle is and the resistance connect them. So now I'm gonna talk about unraveling collecting forms, 
which is a show that I curate last May in 2018. Um, and I use the kipu as a form of reflection and as a form to create this exhibition. This is out, this is a window outside lace. Um, if you don't know what is a kipu, is this um, kipu is talking knots in Quechua. Uh, this kipu that I'm showing here has like 1400, is between 1400 and 1532. It has so many years. Um, it's a uh, written language, it's a device made of dyed knotted threads. Is an ancient Inca multisensory extinct language. Kipus are the vanished narrative of resistance that inspired the exhibition and the public programming. Unraveling collective forms, knots together artistic reflection centered around collectivity, autonomy, and group manifestation that crack systems. And the person that has use kipus um, is this artist, Cecilia Vicuña. Uh, she's a Chilean artist that lives in New York. If probably you know about her, um, she has a big body of work about the kipu. And we present in this exhibition as like the point of entrance um, and the point of departure of the show because she has been developing the kipu and reinterpreting and um, you know creating it in different direction, uh, directions and use it for their performance installation. So this is a book, this is a poem, it's called Chankani Kipu and actually we loan it from special collections in UCSD. So you, you can go and see it, which is a beautiful piece. It comes in a, in a, in a box. So I'm just gonna read a few quotes from her. And these are kind of like a zoom for, for the, um, the piece on spoon wool in the Andean mythopoetic universe on spoon wool stands for what is not yet all potential that on format cosmic gas the life force at work so i am really interested in these ideas of something what is not yet something that is all potential that is on format and in those terms, I see some of my exhibitions, they are not finished yet, they have a specific potential because I don't wanna do big statements, but I just wanna like put a platform for people to experience and actually people, the audience should finish um, these exhibitions. And Unraveling Collective Forms was one of them. And as you see the written language, which is the Western world and these knots that comes from a history of oral history, the ancient Inca world are clashed together here. And she talks about that, like the clashing of these both words. That is something that I think a lot about, specifically when I say I am active in the colonize um, because this is a clash and this is a process of assimilation. And it's also a moment to understand um, this. Is it, it's not a moment, but it's like um, position to understand these two uh, words together and how to decolonize that. Here you can see, um, the exhibition here is Cecilia's piece, Chankani Kipu. And then this is Arsha's hack. And then this big installation 
is Mercedes Dorame. Mercedes Dorame is an artist, is a Tongva artist um, that lives here in Los Angeles. And this beautiful artwork is a, it's an installation, it's a series of photographic images that um, are taken in sacred um, land, in sacred Tongva land. And she does these um, ceremonial interventions on the landscape and then photograph them. Along with that, um, the landscape, she created this installation called The Wind is Speaking, Ahiken Shishinamok. And again, she's also using the Tongva language. And this is very important for me, even if it's a written language, even just mentioning is a way to revive these, these languages that are in extinction. Here you can see a detail of the installation. Um, and then in the center, if you notice, there's these uh, artifacts that looks like stars. These are replicas of artifacts or objects that has been found in sacred uh, land, Tongva land here in California. Because uh, she also is a, a cultural consultant. So she's like in charge also of the history of her people. Um, and then she used these forms, she is a replica of these stars that usually anthropologists are trying to figure out the, that this, they are interpreted as a tool and she is interpreted as a ceremonial um, artifact. Her work is very interesting to me because she's reimagining a history that has been completely erased, almost erased, uh, and the stills alive because the, leap, the people is alive. So she allows herself to use all these different materials to like recreate and think about her heritage. So for Unraveling Collective Forms, I'm gonna play this video while I am talking uh, without sound. This is Agnavi Milan Strangers Union. And this is how we open this show. Um, it was really amazing. Uh, this is organized by Arsha Fatima Hack, And um, this Strangers Union started in the 101 on the freeway and um, in a form of a procession, they start like walking towards lace. And the signs that they were hol holding said, I was a stranger and you welcome me. It was in English and in Urdu. So this procession celebrated um, the people that organized movement the people that walks out that make themselves visible together. Um, she named it a surrealist situationist procession of Swana diaspora. Swana is Southwest Asian and North African diaspora. It was a message for addressing alienation and inclusivity. For me, it was fascinating uh, this idea to call for a union of strangers and aliens, specifically here in the United States. Um, and it was an invitation to be together, to work together. And she has like very different uh, references, but one connected with the intergalactics and the Zapatismo is like the processions that the Zapatistas has been doing, but also the, the schemas called the baklava uh, that the Zapatistas use to cover themselves. And here, they're using this um, silver mask covering their faces. So it's an idea of making visible the invisible by covering uh, the masks. So, oops, I'm gonna play, sorry, 
about that. I'm gonna play a little bit with the music now. this procession dancing and that's how we open this show and then they remove their mask and create a song on this tapestry. So this is how, I don't know if you can see this, but um, this is how the show looks like or look like in that moment. The sign in the front was in Urdu and when you were leaving the show, it was in English. Um, on the left side, we have Kim Sun Fe, um, Sculpture, Harry Gamboa Jr., Carolina Caicedo, and Tania Aguiniga. This is the six expanse um, project of Harry Gamboa Jr. is in the bridge of actually here in Boyle Heights, a few blocks away from I am. Um, this bridge doesn't exist anymore. So she, he, Harry, created this series of photo novella of like collective um, resistance holding the bridge before it was going to be demolished. Uh, Carolina Caicedo is a very interesting artist that has been doing a lot of work here in Los Angeles and in Colombia and now in other parts of the United States. Um, and this series of drawings, call it My Female Lineage, um, Sorry, the truck of the ice cream is now um, coming by. So if you have any doubt that I'm in Boyle Heights, um, now you know I am here. Um, so this artwork is called My Female Lineage of Environmental Resistance. And it's a collection of 100 portraits of women that has been advocating activists that has been fighting for environmental justice. Here in the center, you can see Berta Caceres, um, the Honduran amazing activist that was murdered a few years ago. Um, and this artwork was really interesting because it was just like portraits, black and white. And for me thinking, about collectivity, about these interconnections all around the world. Um, this artwork will make that in terms of like all these women that are individuals are fighting, are organizing in their different places and in their different moments and all together are creating a force, a front. Part of the show, as I mentioned before, it was the public programming. The public programming, which is a very important part of for me in terms of like how to activate an exhibition and not just become an exhibition that is just for an individual or having like a very personal experience, but also um, having a more uh, group experience like 
the different activities that we have. And that's why I um, decided to work with Carolina and also because she has been a great colleague and friend and I have worked with her before and I like her work. So for this event, we invite the East Jar Communities for Environmental Justice, which is a community-based organization that works to facilitate self-advocate in East LA, um, in Southeast and also Long Beach. And they usually like, the idea is like they provide tools to their community to for them to create action, to make decisions and to demand to the government. So it's a very interesting project that we have uh, coming to present. And we invite three active activist members. Um, it was a very awesome uh, project. Um, the whole project was called uh, Environmental Oral Histories of environmental resistance. And the three of them, this girl has 16 years old, Jennifer Reyes, she was amazing. She was very articulate and has like a very conscious and uh, very well understanding of where she lives and how this place of working class has been um, uh, contaminated and she has been uh, creating her own uh, activist projects. And same here, um, Hilda Duenas and Dimas a friend. So in this activity, Carolina also gave us these chords and asked us to like do not when we thought that uh, something interesting was happening. And so at the end, this was a collective kipu that we created from from that oral history um, event. Then in this other side of the gallery, we have Janet Ellers uh, with this three video installation of the pig, the march and black bullets. This artwork was dedicated to the Haitian people, to the Haitian revolution and for me, it was also very interesting because in this video, I couldn't put the video, but um, you can see there is a black pig and it's just a video, all of them black and white and uh, film it in Haiti. And that video connects speeches of the Black Panthers along with, um, actually it's Angela Davis, talking along with the Haitian, some leaders speaking from the Haitian revolution. So again, we have different times, different revolutions cross referencing and creating a new, a new energy. So this is um, Monica Rodriguez and Jorge Gonzalez. So, Monica Rodriguez. So sorry, I have to say that it's very weird that I can't see anybody, but I'm imagining people seeing, uh, listening to me, I hope so. Um, so Monica Rodriguez created this with Jorge Gonzalez, Una Extranjera Peligrosa, A Dangerous Foreigner. And she has been developing this project of creating the library of Luisa Capetillo, who was an anarcho-feminist, a Puerto Rican anarcho-feminist. Actually, she was the first one that wore a suit. And she was doing a lot of work of uh, collective learning. And Monica, she's also a great artist. She has been creating this library from scratch. It's not that exists a document of all the books that Luisa Capetillo had, but it's more like by reading her text, locating her um, influence, her like her quotes and everything. That's how she has been uh, collecting and creating this library. Jorge, who is other Puerto Rican and actually Boricuan, we decide that uh, for this show, they decide that they wanna be Boricua 
which is means this mix of indigenous and also, you know, like um, in, in, in Puerto Rico and uh, no go for the national uh, from the nation. Uh, so he has this project called Escuela de Oficios, a school of crafts. And this is a detail of the theater curtain that was a, again, like experimental collective learning. And I think these two projects are very connected with that. And he has been working in art crafts, um, learning uh, traditions that are in a process of getting disappear. And he has been learning and creating his own knowledge and also sharing knowledge with the other art crafters in Puerto Rico. And this circular carpet also is part of this uh, project is a cocktail handcrafted um, circular tapestry. And I, if you see when I was talking about a multi-dimensional uh, curatorial practice, I am very interested if you see there's a lot of like things that go up into the ceiling, but also things that are on the floor. Um, so that was like very intentional in terms of like the body engaging the exhibition differently. And here you can see an event that they have was called Ensayos Libertarios, My Knock, Libertarian Aces Making. Uh, My Knock is Tongva. So what we did here, um, thinking about white and um, learning uh, process, uh, we invite Julia Bugani, who she is sitting here in the back in the in the table, and she's a Tongva educa educator and consultant, and she um, she teaches how to do baskets. So the event was, the idea of the event was to combine basket weaving with out loud readings from Luisa Capetillo. So these two techniques of making and listening and learning um, are very important and were very interesting in this terms because you will say what a Tongva woman has, a con what connection does she has with uh, Luisa Capetillo, who is from other time, from Puerto Rico and from, they have many, many connections. Um, and that, those connections happen while making the weaving in collective. Then I'm gonna show, uh, I might go a little bit more faster, but um, I wanna show these other two pieces um, that were in the back of the exhibition. And um, you can see this orange train is in Mexico City and this is, uh, video installation of Tania Candiani, who is also a great artist. Um, and the title, sorry, I actually, I'm actually, sorry, I can see the slides. So I'm actually gonna talk first about this tapestry, tapestry which is uh, Israel Martinez. He's from Guadalajara, Mexico. And this is Punks Against the System. This was a beautiful tapestry made by hand. Um, and this image is from a hyper-local punk scene in Guadalajara. So again, talking about why and talking about like long distances, but also of unraveling collecting forms. Um, in the back, we have a video which is called Reexistir, um, Reexist, and also a, a series of interviews that he did to women that were part of this very male scene that you can see in this tapestry. And they were talking about 
how was their experience in this punk scene and how from there they develop different feminist uh, projects in, in Guadalajara. So this is a detail from behind the tapestry and you can see these knots. No, going back to the idea of knotting, of creating knots, of shifting, using the hands, the experience also of, of like a sensory experience. And this is a detail from the front um, of this uh, tapestry or gobelin, that's how they call it. And this also was made by Samuel Alba. He was the art crafter and he's uh, an indigenous uh, person from Guadalajara that um, he participated in this also punk scene. So this is Tania Candiani. Um, so Tania uh, is an artist from Mexico City. Well, now she lives in Mexico City. And this is Pulse. And this video installation was very powerful because the sound of the drums. Um, this is a documentation, it's a film of a documentation of a sound action that happened in 2016, I believe. Yeah, in the underground, in the metro system of Mexico City, at, 195 women were holding drums, uh, pre-Hispanic drums and Raramuri drums. And they were located in different stations and they were taking the train, traveling around, playing, drumming uh, until they all arrived to a, a specific station that is very deep and has a spiral stairs where they were playing and making very, very loud sounds. This was a very important project for me because the, it was very powerful in terms of seeing all these women taking over uh, the train system, uh, taking over of a vulnerable place for women in Mexico and being loud and with sound evocating um, this energy that uh, we need. So here, this is Tania Aguiniga. She, we create this in collective. Uh, it was called Movement as Translation of Emotions, Material as Witness. Um, Tania talks about exploring tactile transmissions. Um, so for her, uh, the exercise of gathering uh, in the gallery and create together uh, this, this piece by knotting, whatever you feel, she gave us this course and then we were um, knotting, knotting them and uh, she was talking about tactile transmission, about memory, about uh, the woman that has been teaching us in our lives. Um, so it was like a culmination of these um, of these events were the culmination of the of the piece. Here you can see there was like a big pot of ink of black ink, and then once you knot was done or your whatever object you create, you will dip it and then pin it on the wall. And then there was a second, this was a pre, pre the show, we, before we opened the show and this was post show, like while, while we were on the show and it was a different dynamic and it was more open to the public. So this is how the show looked like. I was also very interested. I was working um, with the lace team and really thinking about how to organize the space. And um, I wanted to have like a big space where people can sit down and enjoy each of the individual artworks, but at the same time, see the other engage with 
to surrounding. So the drums, for example, were like really sounding in all the gallery. Um, then um, this is, this is a sky hopinka, has like an awesome film, and we have the sound. We were using this beautiful ceiling as a speaker, and um, yeah, we have the sound running. So I'm just gonna show more of the photos and then I'm just gonna finalize. Oh, I wanna show uh, Sayak Valencia was part of, um, we invite her, so it was part of the show. Um, Patrice Coulars did a performance on the street, um, a homage to Nipsey Hui. And then Demian Dinejasi and Holland Andrews, uh, they close the exhibition with an infected sunset performance. Uh, queer indigenous um, performance that um, is a poem that uh, they wrote, Damian wrote, um, a beautiful performance. So I just wanna finish the talk now um, with this quote, um, because actually that's how I finished the show. At the end of the show, uh, having a vinyl, this quote that comes from um, comes from the Zapatistas, and I was very inspired. I'm very inspired by indigenous knowledge. Instead, using theory, fancy theory, and very interesting theory like the French theory Foucault or I mean, I am influenced by that, but I am always trying to look into other type of knowledge. And the Zapatismo has been a very interesting way for me to create, to use their ideas, their forms, their expressions, uh, to use it for me to like reinterpret it in my own context. Um, and also all other indigenous movements and social movements are always, as I say, they're part of my, my practice. And this is in 2012, in December 21, when the new president in that moment, Enrique Peña Nieto, who was a horrible president um, from the pre, they came out from the mountains and they, they live hidden in the mountains, very far away in the jungle and very far from the city. And they came out in a big procession march in completely silence, just wearing their mask and they have like numbers. So I guess there was like a form for them to protect themselves and organize themselves, but they came walking, which has, for me is like an amazing moment in the history uh, of collectivities. And they came in silence, in complete silence, and then full the plaza of San Cristobal and then go back and leave. That was a manifestation. And the only communique that they sent was this that says, did you listen? It is the sound of your world falling apart. It is the sound of our world re-emerging. The day that was the day was the night, and night will be the day. From the mountains in the southeast of Mexico, Revolutionary Clandestine Indigenous Committee, General Command, EZLN. So I wanna close with this quote um, because that's, yeah, it's a very inspired quote and, um, also maybe for this moment could be, the Zapatistas could be a source of inspiration and a source for reimagine and redirect um, our practices. And as, as I say, my curatorial practice is very connected with the relationships around me, the connections, the context. So yes, that's it, thank you. And I guess I will pass for the Q&A, right?
Should I stop sharing? Thank you so much, Daniela. That was an amazing lecture. I really enjoyed that. Um, my name is Bailey Davenport. I'm a second year MFA student at UCSD and I'm the graduate student coordinator for the grad lecture series. And I'm just gonna moderate the Q&A. The first question we had is from Annabelle. She asks, when looking at, uh, I'm gonna apologize for my pronunciation. Aragua Fatima Hawks show, what pros cons are there to the transition from a physical movement with music to an indoor setting when trying to convey a powerful message? Um, I think it was, it was very interesting in terms of how the performance had their own autonomy apart from the show because it starts on the street on the boulevard and whoever was there had that experience and it wasn't like a, oh come to the gallery you know it was just like fill this and go through this and there was people that really like follow them and they were like dancing with them and arrive to lace and connect with the space and um and the fact that it was an indoor space, I don't think it was a, a, contradi a contradictory thing because um, the show was in the same line of the manifestation. And I, and I think both experience and many, I'm sure many people experience it differently. Um, probably some, you know, it's like a touristic area, but also it's like an area with a lot of people, neighbors without home, and um, and people that just goes and enjoy the street. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Annabelle asked a couple of questions. Uh, her next question was, how was the experience of trying to get Latinx trans feminist issues in the museum then? Did you feel supported by the museums? Um, well, lace is, thank you for the question, Annabella. Um, lace is a very interesting place because I really can do this type of work. And um, I haven't had there any like um, limitation. Uh, also it's a place uh, owned by the transgender community and like different communities, not only that one, the Latinx and um, so I think um, in, in at least there's no problem. I having had the experience to be in a bigger museum, I have worked at the Armory Center for the Arts, but I can imagine it will be different. I have worked also with the city and yeah, I can see um, those discourses being seen differently, but um, I think also curating is a very interesting way uh, for introducing this discourse because you can negotiate and can communicate the specific things and create other things, you know, like the negotiation is very important for a curator in those terms, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Uh, Jessica asks, I was wondering when we are presenting some sensitive topic to the public, in what ways can we make it more acceptable for the majority of viewers? Um, I will say it's, I think the, the fact, I really believe that the art is a vehicle to talk about these topics and also opening art spaces for activists to come in and opening spaces for academics like SIAC to come in um, creates a different dynamic and a different dialogue that if she was just talking to a group of uh, theorists and feminists in UCLA or like, uh, you know, it's like it was a totally different uh, way of communicate and I think uh, that's why we need to defend our art spaces now that we are like in a lot of risk um, 
because they are the places where we can really have a dialogue and a real conversation and more direct, more human. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's see. Joseph asks, I was really moved by your comment about gesturing toward an indigenous Zapatista informed curatorial practice. Have you written much about this or do you intend to? Oh, uh, right. Um, yes, I actually, my um, thesis, that's how I start my research formally because since I was a teenager, I was um, very interested in the Zapatismo. But um, yeah, my thesis is actually a review of artistic practices in Mexico City and the influence of the Zapatismo in these practices. Um, so yeah, I have write about that, yeah. Uh, Alexis asks, is there a specific piece artwork at the museum that catches your attention the most and you yourself find it fascinating the way it turned out? Um, all of them were very interesting, I guess. Um, and also I would say lace is not a museum. That's like a very institutional word. Um, and you should come and visit us whenever you have chance. Um, yeah, we are an art space and it has this artist running feeling. So um, yeah, um, I guess one of the pieces that were very interesting, it was um, the, I'm trying to think because all of them were very, very powerful to me. Um, I think like uh, Mercedes Dorame, the Tongva installation was very appealing for the people that is walking on the street and they will come in and they will like question it, what is this? What is this language? And um, I think uh, they, it has like, a really beautiful also connection with Cecilia's Vicuñas um, and dialogue between these Asians. And yeah, we have a lot of people actually the opening, <laughs> this is a very fun anecdote, but also a very powerful anecdote. And the opening, this guy come inside the, like the first person that comes is this guy. Um, and he just like, fall in his nails and look at her and at, in front of Mercedes Dorame. And he say, thank you. You know, he was like in something, um, but it was just like powerful, like this, this dynamics. Um, but I think, yeah, people were asking a lot about that piece. Yeah, that's a powerful piece. That's uh, really interesting that that guy was so moved. <laughs> um, let's go back to Annabelle's other questions. Uh, she asks, what is trans feminism? Why is it important to have this discourse in museums or art spaces? Yeah, um, so yeah, this is like this concept that Sayak has been developing and I am very interested because she's talking about alliances, about building bridges and uh, to form coalitions apart from um, taking distance from the most Western feminism, um, more like white feminism and looking more into other forms, uh, POC feminism, you know, like looking into the Chicana uh, feminist writings and uh, the black writings. And uh, I think um, it's kind of that looking for alliances and, uh, and tracing them and building together. Also, you can read, if you wanna know more about this, uh, you can read uh, Capitalism Gore that she wrote. And also we have in our website, all the things that I present, we have a series of podcasts and videos. We have an archive of all this um, material is, is available online. Awesome, I'll have to check that out. Uh, Andrea asks, what is the difference between an art space and a museum? Would you say that an art space is more inclusive towards representing Latinx communities? I guess it depends on the museum, um, but definitely the art space 
uh, also we are like a medium art space, you know, that like we're like a nonprofit. We're kind of like an institution, um, but it gives us the fact that we are just a team of four people. It gives us a lot of um, flexibility, um, but also it's a lot of a struggle. Um, we don't have like this big um, donors uh, controlling the space. I would say like maybe that's one of the difference uh, where the money where the money comes from. Um, and I think um, there's more flexibility in terms of using the space. There's less limitations and um, there's less bureaucracy to go through. And, um, but I'm not saying like museums are not good. I think they are great, but I think LACE is a very great place for a laboratory for experimenting which things that you cannot really do in a, in a, in a museum, you know? Yeah, art spaces are really important. Um, he asks, thank you for a great lecture. How is LACE funded? We went into that a little bit in your answer uh, and participating artists and community members get funded as well. I also ask this because of the pandemic thinking about the future. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, also, Thank you for thinking about the future because it's very difficult right now to project into the future, but we are trying. And uh, yeah, the funding from LACE comes from different parts. We have a board um, who supports um, mainly LACE, but also we apply constantly every single day, almost. Um, I'm exaggerating. We apply a lot for grants. So um, Philomena said in the beginning that we just got the Mike Kelly to create a show that I have been doing research, but I didn't have the funds right away. So we work a lot with grants. Um, fortunately here in the United States, there's a lot of private foundations that are still supporting arts. And uh, we get some also grants from the, the government, uh, from the city and private donors that believe in our work and they like donate. But yeah, it's a very difficult time. And um, I think foundations are really thinking about us and they are thinking about this type of spaces because um, the crisis is, the economic crisis is gonna be very difficult, but their support, you know, like the Getty is also has like a new initiative to support spaces and there's different. Um, but we also don't wanna rely with all this foundation. We also wanna rely with our own community. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Guillermo asks, do you think the oral history and collaborations in the art practice are important to generate alternatives to come down with more ideas? Definitely. Um, I think oral history has been like a constant tool for lace exhibitions. Um, and um, yeah, it's another form of knowledge uh, that is there that is not that direct, like reading a academic text or a theory, um, but there's a lot of knowledge in just, for example, the, what I talk about the East Yard communities, uh, just hearing about their own experience, uh, that is very valuable for looking into different perspectives and also to look in, into other worlds that we are not used to. You know, like, because sometimes we're just in looking in one direction, the most familiar direction, but experience and hearing oral history is definitely uh, a, a great tool for this. Mm -hmm. Felix asks, can you talk a little bit more about your recent research with intergalactics and any aspects of this research that you're especially excited about and or future projects? Thank you. Yeah, um, so Intergalactics Against Isolation Contra el Aislamiento is a research that I started in 2018 and I wanted to 
I've been working in the border between Mexico and the US, uh, working with artists in Tijuana and Mexicali. And I read also a lot of the Zapatistas communiques. And one of the communications I remember saying when Trump uh, won the presidency, they were saying, hey, yeah, this is gonna be hard. Um, the border between Mexico and the US it's gonna grow, but also Jewish people should look into the South border, the next border that the US um, is, is building. And that's where they are in the South of Mexico in border with Guatemala and Central America. So I really wanted to expand um, my research into Central America because LA has a big community of Guatemalan, uh, the Guatemala community, the Honduran community and the Salvadorian community. And they have, the diaspora is very interesting, the artistic practices um, here and there uh, are very important. And I just think that I wanna use this idea of intergalactics to do these, these connections to create a platform for us to have uh, be more connected and share knowledge between Central America, Mexico, and the US. So part of my research has been going to, to I recently visited El Salvador and that was really amazing for me to get to know all this art scene there. Um, I was planning to go after El Salvador to Guatemala, but because the this thing, um, I don't like to say it because you bring it. <laughs> uh, because this thing, I have to come back um, to the U.S. Um, and um, thinking a lot about isolation. I was thinking a lot about isolation in terms of detention centers, how people is isolated there, uh, and now. I guess I'm thinking about other type of isolation. Um, yeah, like this idea of, of like really, you know, talk, be together, but um, against this pressure that they are pushing us for, for isolation. So I really want to like reverse, not reverse that, but I know like a lot of collectives and artists are working around that. And I wanted uh, to study that, that idea of um, intergalactics, which is the contrary of isolation. And right now I'm thinking a lot about um, mobility, um, which is, it's part of the, the migration theme, but um, how, yeah, how we can be connected without being present. Well, that's awesome. Uh, I think on that note, that's all the time we have for questions. I just want to thank you again for taking the time to join us today, Daniela. It was really a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And um, thank you to everybody out there. Great. Thanks. See you guys next time. Bye.